Here we go. Eric Stromquist. Welcome to Control Talk. Now your smart buildings video cast and podcast for the week ending January 19th, 2020. This is episode 346 where we talk about HVAC stuff, smart building controls, football, whatever the man to myth the legend's been up to, whatever we want to. And speaking of the man to myth the legend, what would his show be without your co-host and mine? The one, the only, Kenny Secret Agent Man Smyers, the control man of Pittsburgh. Kenny, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Eric. It's uh, always fun. Every every uh, week, I look forward to it. Uh, today, we're looking at a, oh, about three inches of snow and about 27 degrees here in Pittsburgh. And I can tell it's a little bit warmer down there in Atlanta, but we're all moving forward regardless down to Orlando here in the next couple of days. We're going to be selling down in Orlando, Florida for the Control Trends Awards and the AHR show. It's going to be great. Hey, can you do me a favor? My kids have never seen snow. Do you mind out going out real quick and getting a snowball and bringing it back in so I could show it to them? I mean, like right now? Yeah, like right now. Well, it's going to be disruptive. Sure. Hey, we're in disruptive today. No, I'm just teasing. We'll do it later. <laughs> take a picture of you holding a snowball. No, don't do it. It's okay. Put your head and set back on. I just want to see if you do it, but take a picture later and send it to me and I'll show my kids that way. But uh, I think most of our control trends community has seen snow before probably more than they would ever care to, but my kids have never seen it. So um, hopefully we'll get some snow this year in Atlanta. Really? Kenny, I, that's Ken, hard to believe. I guess. Yeah. Kenny, it's a big, 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 big week. Uh, we're getting closer to the control trends awards. And as such, our finalist, we try to give them as first come first serve the opportunity to come on the show to make sure the control trends community knows about them, their products, their companies in such a way that they can make an informed decision when they vote, because we're in the voting process right now. We're in the finals. This will determine who wins the awards at the February 2nd control trends awards in Orlando. You can voting ballot is on the website. You can click on that. But as such this week, we got a very, very special disc tech, show we got guests from this tech so how about introducing our first guest love to Eric. two of the most exciting people in an exciting business we have scott hamilton vice president of sales and we have lauren scott she is the director of marketing for this tech welcome to the show welcome, thank you guys. thanks for having, having us. us we're so glad to have you here so the first question on the control trends community's minds because you guys are both in leadership lauren i mean you protect and create the brand scott i mean you you know you protect the customers how do you guys reel Ryan Sin in? I mean, how, how, how is it to manage that guy? <laughs> well, you, I don't know if you know, uh, Eric and Ken, you know, uh, Ryan has a, uh, his title CEO. He's a chief entertainment officer for the, yes. for the company. So he's really, uh, he's, he's really a challenge to reel in. But uh, no, he's, he's a great impact player for us. Well, well yes. And, and I think, you know, a part, part of the reason I bring that up, the first award you guys got involved in, I mean, you guys come come up to the event in limousines getting out ryan is leading the charge i mean you guys truly you know have a great time which uh in our industry we're trying to attract more people into the industry so you guys are probably one of the best groups of people to get people attracted to this industry but i know you guys work hard you play hard so hats off to you guys you're doing amazing amazing stuff and and lauren i want to sort of shift gears and talk about you a little bit you're up for the <laughs> woman of the year yeah. uh you do the marketing at Distech. So walk us through how you got in the industry. Then we're going to ask you some specific questions about marketing. Sure. Well, my path to getting here might have been a little bit less conventional. I um, studied marketing at university, worked at a marketing agency the first couple of years. Um, after about two years, I, I really realized that I needed to work for an organization that was in line with my values. So uh, made the switch over from an agency over to the nonprofit world for a number of years uh, where I was working as a spokesperson internationally, um, also behind the scenes managing PR and communications. And then in 2013, I remember seeing a posting for a job specializing in innovations for greener buildings here in Montreal. And it just, I remember I couldn't sleep that night. I said, I have to work for this company. It's right in line with my values. 
and uh, I went for the interview and I, I started in 2013. So going on seven years ago um, and it's been a great six months. Well, listen, I mean, Distech obviously has got a lot working for it and you mentioned the word values. So mm -hmm. tell, talk to me a little bit about Distech's values and, and what attracted you about those. I, What's really special about Distech is I think that the, the leadership team across the company um, and throughout all of our employees that there's really, really strong values and that's uh, credit since I think since the founding of the company. Um, but having Martin back at the helm for Distech is certainly seeing it echoed across the, the organization. So it's, it's heavily valued in innovation, um, creating greener buildings, but then at the same time just really valuing our customers, their satisfaction and internal customers with our employees as well. Uh, we, it is really like a family. I took 18 months off um, between 2016 and 2017, uh, where I was working for a wind energy company where it was phenomenal, but I remember I just missed the distech people, I missed the culture, uh, and it's something that really rings true when I came back. It, it was fitting right back in with those values, so it, it's, it's phenomenal. Well, before Kenny asks the next question, I, 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 I got to know because when, when you start thinking about branding, and, mm -hmm. and I think we're all struggling, especially in today's world of social media with our brand. Uh, wow, I mean, Distech is just synonymous with just innovative, great products that just work. Uh, speak, if you will, a little bit about, uh, I mean, was that a conscious, I mean, consciously, obviously you guys did that, but how, how did you guys sort of create the Distech brand? And then how are you sort of, uh, continuing to get it out because I, I don't think anybody does social media better than you guys. <laughs> well, I'll have to let uh, the member of my team know that, that she works really, really hard on it. Uh, I think social media is an interesting time right now. It's certainly a way to cut through the clutter. Our community of customers and employees are featured and regularly interacting with us on social media. I think we're all oversatiated and oversaturated with emails right now. So it's a, a different touch point and it allows for a more human approach. And I think that human approach is what Distech Controls is known for. So it's a really good fit in that sense. Um, and then the technology, you know, I can't take credit for that necessarily, but we have this exciting technology coming out from Distech. Uh, you know, back in, in 2014, 2015, when we were the first in the industry to launch the IP line, um, to now where we're at with this incredible mobile app, it's just exciting product. Our whole marketing team, uh, we have people here in Montreal. We also have people in France when we're sitting in and finding out what's coming out next. We genuinely get excited, and I see, think that that is seen and comes through in our social media and our communications in general. Well, that's, uh, that's good stuff, uh, Lauren. I, I, I got a kick out of it because I, I finally found out what Distech stood for. It's uh, distributed technologies, you know? Mm -hmm, and uh, mm -hmm. and I, 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 to Eric's point, uh, this tech is on a meteoric rise in our industry. Uh, we feel it everywhere we go. We feel it from the user, uh, people that pull things into their communities uh, through these uh, national meetings and whatever. So this tech's doing a great job. So you get challenged by, you had to do the channel and marketing communication programs. You got to do product commercialization, branding strategies mm -hmm. you mentioned, multimedia and multi-channel promotions and public relations. Mm -hmm. Of those chores and duties and responsibilities, which one do you find to be your favorite and which one's the hardest? Oh, good question. <laughs> uh, I would say the hardest is probably when we're, we're launching that new product to make sure that we're making that message that is fully accessible for our entire market. Historically, I think uh, our BMS in general, we were very, very technical in what, the way we were speaking. And I think we could pretty much take what was give, being given to marketing and communicate that back out. But now when we're seeing that we're having that front end inter, in, interaction with building owners and consulting engineers, we need to have more of a, solu a solution focused messaging. So uh, really doing that transfer of information, making sure that we're making it accessible for everyone and something that resonates and speaks to them uh, is certainly an exciting challenge for our team. Um, and then especially deploying that globally, what might resonate here in North America might be a very different message right. for what's going on in France. Well said, well said. Yeah, and what's your fun, what's your favorite? Oh, um, I, I would have been surprised if you had asked me this a couple of years ago, um, but I really do love events. Uh, it's not at all my background, um, but to have that face time, you know, coming up with AHR, it's the opportunity throughout the year where people, where we fire off emails back and forth all year, we actually get a, a chance to sit down and talk to people. Um, I think that's phenomenal and then be able to showcase our latest technology. It's usually historically we're just tech controlled. We've been 
launching new products. It's the first time sneak peek that we get um, to show what we've been working on. So it's an exciting moment where everything pulls together. Oh, very well said. Very, very cool, Lauren. Well, listen, Scott, I mean, you've been around the block a few times in the controls industry. I know you're excited to be at DISTEC and especially excited to probably work with Lauren, having somebody that creates a brand like that. Brand awareness makes, makes the sales job a lot easier. Absolutely. Tell our community sort of your path to DISTEC. Yeah, you know, uh, a little bit like Lauren, my, mine was a little bit unconventional. However, it was always uh, well-rounded in the commercial construction uh, uh, industry. And so uh, I started off uh, with GE in the lighting industry. So I was with GE Lighting for about five years. Uh, and, and from there, I went into, so I was more in a sales and account management roles and then moved over to uh, Siemens Industry, which is uh, their power distribution arm. So a switch gear, uh, so power distribution, more business development, channel management, brand management, uh, sales management as well. And in, back in uh, 2013, moved over to Siemens Building Technology. So that was my uh, first uh, uh, dip my toes into building automation. So not so long ago. And uh, at that point in time, I was a senior director for the indirect channels for, uh, for, the, for the U.S., and uh, just about two years ago, came over to Distec Controls into a really what I consider probably my most exciting role and most exciting company that I've been with. So, so uh, in, interesting enough, Acuity Brands, of, of course, as you know, owns uh, um, Distec Controls. Uh, so start off in lighting and, and somewhat back in lighting at the same time. Lighting has now become, I remember one of the presentations was that no matter what, get the lighting done. Don't dispute get lights in, you know, get LEDs in, get the, a modern lighting system and you'll start saving money immediately. But the real key was tying lighting into HVAC and having the ability to do that, uh, you know, with a unified intention so that you're maximizing all, all the, the algorithms are finding the best solutions instead of having two separate uh, systems feeding the information in the latencies and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the, you know, that, that uh, you know, how Acuity and, and Distech complemented each other and, and how that product got started. Yeah, Ken, I think to your point, I mean, you've got the, you've had two separate disciplines over the course of time, right? You've had the electrical with the lighting side, you've had the BMS through the mechanical. And, you know, what we've had uh, success in doing, and, and you and, and, and Eric were, um, you know, had featured the 555 Jones Lang LaSalle building in Washington, D.C., is, is bringing that, bringing that uh, vision to life where, you know, the, the room not only operates better, but it's, but it's, it's really, as, as we look at to the future, it's, it's a lot about the occupant experience. And, and so what that's provided us is the ability to have a superior occupant experience um, in the industry. So as, as, uh, as you are the user of, of, a, of an app, for example, that, that can control lighting, uh, shades, as well as HVAC uh, in the palm of your own hand. So the ability to show that, display that, because today I think as we look at um, a lot of the brand new buildings that are going up and there's still a lot of cranes up in the air, as you know, um, you know, there's existing buildings that uh, have older infrastructure and they're competing for tenants. So in that, those particular spaces like 555, they've now been able to differentiate their building versus that's been around uh, for 25 years versus a building that's, uh, you know, brand new going up across the street. So it's that opportunity to really differentiate um, the, the building and, and, and take it really from a cost center into a strategic asset. So it's all about having the building work for the owner and, uh, and you know, increase productivity in the space of the people that are in there, um, et cetera. So um, that's really where, you know, where we're focused our efforts as an organization is taking buildings from cost centers to strategic assets. So you've even got different vocabulary. This is amazing because I really think you guys are, you know, spot on it with it. And, and I don't know whether you guys got like a, you know, a soothsayer or something. Maybe Lauren's the one who sort of sits around Lauren. and says, we've got it, you know, I mean, but, but, you know, it's how you position your product and how you position your offering. And you guys are brilliant at that. And, you know, what we've discovered, Lauren, I think you alluded to her earlier, is that people are bombarded with so many messages and there's so many you know, opportunities or things that your, your biggest battle is, you know, getting their, you know, is their, their time and their attention. Because if you waste their time or don't get their attention, it doesn't matter how great a product you have, but you guys really seem to sort of uh, uh, have your finger on the pulse of what people are needing to hear. Uh, and, you know, and one of it, Scott, is obviously it seems now the building is a strategic asset. I mean, you know, it's, it's occurred to us that real estate's competitive like everything else with people working from home and whatnot and the, the younger people coming in. You better have a great space. It better be environmentally friendly. And you better be saving money in it. 
it seems like you guys are hitting on all those all those buttons. True, is that accurate? Yeah, I think we've got a good pulse on on the market, I and mean, we we speak with several end users really on a daily, weekly basis. And you know, we obviously speak with our system integrator channel, our distributor channel as well, and so. I think we do a pretty good job of collecting, collecting data, collecting feedback, um, and, and also trying to really just stay in front of the industry um, as, as an industry leader. I mean, that's, that's our, our, one of our internal commitments is to maintain that technology leadership. And so, uh, you know, with that, you, you, can't, you can't operate in a vacuum, in a silo. You have to make sure that you've got, you know, the air to the ground um, of all the stakeholders. Um, so so the, you know, all the different influencers in the marketplace that uh, can influence whether or not your product is accepted or not. So uh, we do a pretty good job with that overall. Well, I think you guys do. And then sort of back to you, Lauren, because I mean, collecting all the data, I mean, is one thing and getting those facts, but then being able to turn that into a message that's mm -hmm. easily understood, compelling, and, and has people take action. I mean, walk us through that process. How does it get translated into something that's now marketable? I think that's where the, really the advantage of, of DisTech Controls close, um, teams come in, you know, we're, we're growing every single year, both in terms of sales, but then also with human resources and get, and yet we really keep that close collaboration. Um, so it's, it's really making sure that we're keeping those communication channels open between product management, R and D sales and marketing. And then we collaborate to make sure that what we're um, communicating is really at the heart of why we're developing these products. So it's, I would, I would really credit that close collaboration in, in how we've managed to dissect possibly a very complicated message into one that we can easily communicate out into the market. And that seems to really be resonating both with system integrators as well as end users. Yeah. For our community out there, you know, having tried to do some of this, it is much, much easier said than done. I mean, it's mm -hmm. gotta be one of the hardest things to sort of capture and almost a soundbite because we're kind of in a soundbite society now, uh, you know, the essence of what people want and compel them. It's, it's, it's not easy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Certainly, and I, I think that part of it too is just realizing the, the quick, rapid pace in which we're, our, our industry is evolving and keeping up with that at the same time. Um, Martin, who you guys are very familiar with, recently challenged our leadership team to think about where we were 10 years ago and kind of how we've all evolved personally, but that sort of pales in comparison to how quickly our technology has evolved since 2010, uh, to think that us as a manufacturer went from developing uh, pure kind of controllers to now talking about an app that uh, I can use to control my temperature, but then also to find the next meeting room and then to set up going for dinner with my colleagues. It's, it's just complete evolution uh, and it's going faster and faster. So certainly in terms of a messaging standpoint, we really have to keep our, our finger on the pulse of that. Well, that is a great segue to the next thing I was going to bring up. And that was a, a particular app that I know you guys are just dying to talk about. <laughs> Holden, that's my personified workplace, an app fit for today's employees, which you kind of summarized it already, uh, Scott, uh, it, you know, you were talking about it and, and Lauren, you just said it too, but so tell, tell, tell us a little bit about my personified workplace. Yeah, I'll tell you a little bit about it, Ken. And it's, it's an, it's a, basically it's an app based uh, for today's building owners, right? So it's, um, it's really focusing on providing a superior occupant experience. And I, I said a little bit earlier, we talked about it a couple of times here, but taking the building from a cost center to a strategic asset. And it's, this app really supports that vision. So inside of the app and, um, you know, at, at come see us at AHR because it'll be, it'll be featured in our booth. Uh, but inside of the app uh, has everything from comfort management, like we just talked about, the, the, the temperature control, the lighting control, the shading, as well as the ability to, to uh, book rooms. So room reservations. On average, uh, people, 70% of employees spend more than 15% of their time every, each and every day trying to find a room within a building. And that's a, uh, that's a big, talking about productivity, that's a big time saving. There's also tie into uh, Microsoft Office 365 from contact management. There's incident reporting. So if in fact the coffee machine isn't working, so we talk about productivity. So if the coffee, coffee machine isn't working, you know, productivity is going to be lower. I know, especially in the Brassard office, that's the case. We have one on every corner. Uh, we also have location services, 
uh, inside of the app as well. So provide you, uh, okay, meeting rooms on the opposite side of the, bill, of, the, of the office building. It also help you wayfind yourself to that office space as well. So between news, events, uh, as, as, as Lauren had pointed out, you can, you can create an event for people to gather for lunch or for dinner. Uh, you can simply, you know, view menus. It's, it's really a lot of possibilities within, a, within the same application uh, for, the, for the user to, to have that superior experience. Extraordinary. Yeah. Very, very, very cool. Well, listen, uh, I, I kind of want to segue a little bit here because, uh, you know, Distech's known for the great products and we could talk about some more of those. And I don't know. I mean, we've got, I think, uh, what, 21 award categories, Kenny, and Distech's up for 55 awards or something <laughs> like that this year. So, well, so, I, but, I, well the, the community, your involvement, uh, I have to commend you one thing right away. Uh, and Eric and I, notice these things is that when you have uh, kind of a lukewarm community and, and, and the organization doesn't have that morale, they don't have that uh, esprit de corps, they're missing something, you know, and it has to do with a lot of the leadership and it has to do a lot with the, the programming. People have to want to be there. Uh, Lauren, to your point, you came back and missed this tech. I mean, I, I love hearing stuff like that because it almost sounds like a, not a fairy tale, but it sounds like in the day of, of, of so much grief and disruption, that there's there's places that are becoming the new normal and what people want to do and for us it's the movies it's google it's a microsoft's campus it's all these same things but they have and it in our tech. world with controls yeah. and you know, that's what i'm saying so <laughs> I'm there. Yeah, yeah. That, that yeah. there's people that go to work and you can feel that passion that each person brings to the collective plate and how mm -hmm. that generates success across all those difficult areas when there's a rough spot and there's customer problems or whatever, everybody seems to have a positive attitude to get it done. Yeah, Kenny calls you guys the fun bunch, but I think that has a lot to do with Ryan, but, uh, but, yeah. but, but, you know, but, but, yeah. but, to, but to Kenny's point, I mean, it does get back to leadership and values and, you know, Scott, you were up for the executive of the year. So I, I'd like to sort of talk to our community a little bit about, uh, you know, your views on leadership, your values vis-a-vis -vis leadership. And then Lauren, I'm going to ask you to talk about Scott. So Scott, be careful what you say, because Lauren's going to call you out if you're not being congruent. <laughs> and Lauren, I'll, I'll pay you $20 later. Uh, Amer <laughs> U.S. dollars. American, American, American. yeah. <laughs> you, know, I, you know, I think, I think if, if, as I look back on things that I've appreciated in leadership, um, in, in my past, you know, what I think the very found, the very core of the foundation is, is high integrity. So somebody that sets the tone with strong principles and, and at the end of the day, not only sets that tone, but also leads by example. So I'd say that's, that's, that's at the core of, of what I appreciate in, in, in a strong leader. Um, I also think that effective, clear communication is really important, right? So what is the mission? What are the goals? What are we trying to do? Where do we desire to go? And just effectively communicating that uh, throughout the organization so that uh, expectations are really clear and we know, ex you know, we know how we know what the mission is. And so uh, I'd say those are two, two, two real important ones. And in, in, in adding on, I think one of the things that, that we all uh, um, could probably all do a little bit better is just a recognition and appreciation, right? And uh, for achieved results of, of individual team members. And so, you know, that, that pat on the back, that, that kudos from, from, a, from, a, from a leader, I, I think goes a long way. And it's, it's uh, oftentimes, um, you know, it, I think it's, it's overlooked because, you know, people can potentially get, you know, in sp sales specifically, you get your bonus check and that's the thank you, right? So, so I think those, those, are, those are important. And I'd say probably the last one is, is honest feedback. I think one of the things, you know, feedback is, 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 um, is a gift, right? I mean, we don't always get good feedback from, from, from leaders, from managers. So I think that honest, constructive, you know, feedback that comes from a very good place um, that people want to see you improve and get better is, uh, is, is, uh, is, is, is cherished quite that's, often. That's almost more an art than anything else, I think. I mean, I think it's one of those concepts that's easy to understand, to be able to give somebody honest feedback and at the same time not completely demoralize them. Just like I think there's a distinction between managing people and leading people. Um, Absolutely. And, 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 you know, and Scott, when, when I think of you and what I've seen of you, I mean, you just exude leadership, right? You're somebody that, you know, you're fun to be around. I mean, I could, yeah, I, you, I could get on board with, you know, you know, whatever you're selling, I'm buying sort of thing. But, uh, but, but that sort of being said, I sort of want to ask you another leadership question along the way, because we've all had great mentors. What is the best piece of advice you've ever given vis-a-vis -vis leadership? I mean, been, been given vis-a-vis -vis leadership and what's the best piece of advice you could give our community? Yeah, no, that's, that's great question. It's probably a difficult one. I mean, I, I think, 
I, I probably would steal some from my dad growing up, right? Which may be, uh, you know, somebody, I, well, which is somebody that I do look up to and continue to do so today. But one is, you know, just treat other people like how you want to be treated. No matter what the situation is, you don't know how to handle it. I, I always go back to, if I was that person, how would I want to receive that information? So I think that's one of the things that, uh, you know, try to be empathetic to other people and, and sort of walk in their shoes before I give some challenging feedback, right? And because and that's, to your point, it's hard to do. It is a bit of an art. And I always fall back to, geez, you know, what, you know, what, uh, how would I want to be approached with this topic? So I think a bit of treat others how you want to be treated. Um, and then, and then I think the other one is uh, keep your, keep your say do ratio high, right? Which is mm. the say do ratio be do what you say you're going to do. And so, you know, it's accountability, it's follow through and, and, and all those good things. Uh, but you know, you can certainly lose, you know, you can certainly lose trust and uh, by, by not doing what you say you're going to say you're going to do. So I'd say those two things are, are, are uh, rather important. And um, you know, another one of another old adage was uh, loose lips sink ships. So uh, that's <laughs> another one. If somebody tells you something in confidence, don't repeat it. Yeah. And uh, but so I could probably go on a few more, but those those are some off the top of my head. Some very sage advice, Scott. And 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 again, I can say personally from being being around you, I mean that that just resonates uh, as 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 who you are. It's very authentic, Lauren. Uh, Scott, can it come? You've been around for a while, and this character comes on, right, comes on with this tech. Uh, walk us through uh, the first first meetings of Scott and impressions, and what's he what's he like to work with? Remember that twenty dollars? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah I, I, th I think Lauren's thinking it'd be a much better thing if it was fifty dollars. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. With, with, with the Canadian exchange rate, it is almost fifty. So. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I do remember my first meeting with Scott coming up, and, and I think our first discussion was about a long. A long list of exciting ideas that uh, Martin had just given him. <laughs> it was uh, an opportunity for us to already start planning and at the very core of that was uh, our customer conference and something that we have every two years um, and we have coming up this coming November but I remember just kind of getting excited and talking about what was going on there but from a, a colleague perspective I, the first thing that struck me and continues to strike me is certainly his professionalism uh, that he brings to the company and, and not only his role, but it certainly radiates uh, into the rest of the sales team around the world that Scott has probably one of the largest teams in this tech. And uh, in over the last few years, we've just kind of seen this go across the full team is that level of professionalism. All right, Kenny, your question. Well, you know, I, I'm just trying to hesitate there because I think that was about $19.99. That's <laughs> pretty good. I need to hear about the roadmaps. And they took 2019 that they began with all these things on the roadmap and they got them all done. It was, it was like you had products, you had hardware, software, and you had things that were looking pretty challenging and required tremendous commitments and resource commitments and you, you got it done. So, but what is this tech looking at in the near future, the roadmap? Yeah. So, uh, you know, one of the things we uh, we covet is certainly the technology piece and uh, and and hold hold pretty close to our vest. But we are excited about 2020, is what I'll that's say. That's a loose lips thing. I see. Yeah, yeah that's <laughs> right. It's 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 sticking. It's sticking. Uh, so yeah, we're we're pretty excited about what's going to be coming out in 2020 from 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 the business. And uh, and as I said at the beginning, I mean we are absolutely committed to the technology leadership position. So uh, we'll keep it as simple as that. I like that. That's a good answer. Well, I, I had I to do. ask. And, and Scott, Absolutely. you know, be, be, you know, being the sales professional you are and the leader you are, I, I think that, you know, for sure, you probably appreciate, you know, what Lauren's able to bring to the table and, and how important yeah. having good sound marketing and messaging it is, messaging is. So, you know, Lauren's up for the woman of the year. Uh, I'd like to get your opinion. What do you remember when you first met Lauren and, uh, and what does she bring to the table? Yeah. So, I mean, I remember distinctly, uh, you know, first meeting Lauren, I mean, first, yeah, again, professional and high integrity. She is almost the definition of, of, of those two things. Uh, I remember that first, that first interaction, like I said, and, and um, it was, um, it was, it was, it was on our new partner conference and, uh, and she was excited and passionate about um, about bringing it forward a, a few months before we were expected to do it. And, um, you know, I have to say, I think if, let, let me say, you can forego all my votes and give it to Lauren because she's that good. That's, that's what I would say. Nice, um, nice. She is absolutely a leader uh, inside and outside the business. And, and, and she, her actions speak 
much more than in any words I can actually give you. Because if you look at what she, why she came to this deck, the energy, the sustainability piece, little do you know probably that Lauren is also president of Sierra Club for oh, all of Canada. Wow. And, uh, or Eastern Canada, Lauren, which wow. one you can... Uh, it's for their board of directors for all of Canada. Yeah. Board, Congratulations. So wow. Which is pretty amazing. So it's, yeah. it's one of the most, uh, it's one of the largest uh, organizational uh, environmental organizations in, in, uh, in North America. So, uh, so Laura not only, you know, uh, practice what she preaches inside of the company Monday through Friday, but also on her free time, you know, this is near and dear to her. So, you know, I think if we look at integrity and, and if we look at leadership, I mean, certainly, it's every reason why people should vote for for Lauren in in this category of Woman of the Year. And by the mm -hmm. way, I know some of the other women; they're they're amazing. So they a are. great group. And and uh, but Lauren, let's vote yeah. for her. Well, I'll tell you the uh, you hit another great point is that our industry has a whole lot of superstars. In the so Lauren, <laughs> tell us about the great opportunities. That, that Scott, in our Scott can talk about. Well, it's, it's actually funny timing. I was just putting together an article for, for automated buildings um, on this topic, and I, I'm convinced that the labor shortage we're experiencing in, in the BMS or BAS world at the moment is a lot more of a, a marketing problem than it is just a human resources problem. And I think that the big thing that we need to do beyond just marketing directors is become better storytellers about our industry. We have a really incredible um, story to tell, whether it is that environmental component, we are seeing a whole new generation of people trying to find career opportunities that align with their values, and we offer that opportunity. So I think we need to be really proud of that and share that at a whole other level. But at the same time, from a technology standpoint, it also provides us another opportunity, whereas we might have, in, in even a decade ago, been losing some of the te top tech talent to the, the glitz and glamour of Silicon Valley, I think we now have an industry that is pushing the envelope in terms of technology. And it's an exciting time that we can go get those top engineers um, and pull them into our industry. So I think collectively, we just really need to find that story and, and tell it better because it's, it's no longer just about posting on job boards. It's really about having a more compelling message. Lauren, you, you spot on. And listen, Kenny and I will get behind you with that. I mean, I, I love the idea about telling the story because what other industry, I mean, you, you can go to Silicon Valley and live in a cubicle farm if you want to, mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. you can come in our industry and you can actually have data analytics, especially if you're using the disc tech to show just how much you know energy you're saving and how you are affecting the, the environment. It's one of the few industries that I know that you can actually can be different every day and you have a direct effect on the environment. So if we can help in any way with this storytelling, we are, we are totally on. I have, we have cameras, we'll travel. Some of the, the, the problems we're having, Scott, what do you, what do you think, uh, what, what's your assessment on that? And are we, are we heading in the right direction? Yeah, you know, I, I, I agree with Lauren. I mean, it is, a, it is an industry problem, right? So if we look at our ability to grow, it's not today and, and certainly into the short term future, it's not about, you know, you know, cranes going up and buildings going up. It's it's the ability to execute those types of projects. So we we is we feel like we need to not only uh, lead that effort, but really come up with some solutions that help the entire industry. And it's you know I I, I think all manufacturers we can help each other um, in and as well as as well as our system integrator partners, our distributor partners. We can all help each other by 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 getting more. I, I think. Um, um, aggressive, if you will, um, in, in the marketing piece and, and making sure that hey, we, we're doing some pretty neat stuff today as an industry. And, um, and I think it's just the words just not getting out there as, as, um, you know, as, as quickly as it needs to be and as effectively as it needs to be. So that marketing piece is, is a big deal. And it's, and it is a topic uh, that Lauren's not only writing a, a paper on internally, but it's one that we're talking about on a very consistent basis with our customers. Lauren, I want to shift back to you for a minute. Uh, I have a suspicion here. I have a suspicion that along the way, you've had at least one, maybe two mentors that you really looked up to and sort of shaped um, shaped who you are. Uh, is that accurate? And if so, tell us about your mentor and what they taught you. A few along the way. Um, one that really stands out is during those, uh, those two years where I was uh, away from just tech controls, I had the opportunity to work for an incredible woman who was a corp uh, director of corporate relations at a German wind energy company. And she was 
extremely, she probably would have fit right in with the, the DISTEC leadership team in terms of just kind of um, being very honest, hardworking individual. And I remember she said something to me uh, that I continue to keep, to keep in mind on a daily basis. And it's just three simple sentences, but it's show up, mean it, make it better. And um, I just think those three words ring true. I try to think of it every day in coming into meetings. Um, and I certainly will keep it in mind going forward as well. Very, very nice. That's excellent. So I'm guessing based on the fact you're with the Sierra Club that you, uh, that you, your free time you spend inside watching TV shows and, and not going <laughs> out much. But so, so do, are you a big uh, outdoors person as well? Very big outdoors person. Um, probably one of the reasons that I got into wanting to, to, one of the reasons I wanted to get into conservation was really kind of that love of the outdoors. I was fortunate to have a family cottage right next to Vermont on the Canadian side. It's a beautiful area and it's a, a place that I'm hoping to go to in the next couple of days. So uh, yeah, I would say it's at the core probably of why I want to put so much effort into preserving it. We're going to need to start wrapping it up here. Kenny, think of your last question, and I'm going to ask one before then. And uh, Lauren, you know, it's I, I want to sort, sort of cycle back to social media because you guys are so active on the different platforms. And the one that I think has the most possibility, as near as I can tell, but is also the hardest one to crack seems to be Instagram. I know you guys mm -hmm. are actively on that. Uh, yeah. For our community out there, what have you found to be the best platforms? And it, how do you crack Instagram? Because I'm still trying to do that. I, I think I have four followers now, but three of them are family members. <laughs> we're, the, we're the fourth one then. <laughs> there you go. Nice, nice. <laughs> yeah, uh, certainly right now the most successful social media platform for us has been LinkedIn. Just a combination of our customers as well as our employees being on there and then our broader community. It's been a really successful platform. Instagram is newer for us. At the same time, we are seeing it take off in terms of followers. And that's really a question of content. It's very, very visual. I think that speaks to that shorter attention span that we were talking about a little mm. bit before. Of we need some high impact visuals, not paragraphs of text and email. So it's challenging us from to find those visual cues that might speak to a larger audience. No longer can we just show uh, from this tech a blue box, one of our controllers, but we really have to show that end solution and what makes it so exciting um, from a solution standpoint. And then I think it is really just in involving the humans that we interact with on a daily basis. We love to feature our customers, we love to feature our employees, and that seems to really resonate and it, and it plays to that human factor of this tech as well. Well done. Well, dang, I, 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 I don't wanna be anticlimactic here, but I just wanted to remind everybody that we're going to transition right from the Control Trends Awards into the 54th Super Bowl. So my question <laughs> uh, is, is to you both, Scott, uh, it's going to be more casual, and uh, I know that you're still bruised that the Patriots are Oof. are out, out of out of the way here, and and then you can, but you're welcome to wear your Patriot shirt uh, because it's going to be a football tailgate party, and we got people putting team jerseys together and wearing team hats or whatever, or uh, I might see some Steeler stuff from my side of the family, but. Um, and uh, what are you going to be wearing? And Lauren, since you all don't play football, uh, well, you do, <laughs> but I don't think you, you're a Canadian football uh, follower. How no. are you going to deal with this tailgate party? You know, Ken, I, do you think I get away with wearing a uh, Tom Brady shirt there? Yeah, I, so sure. Get, you look uh, a little bit like Tom Brady. You, oh. you, no, no, <laughs> no. I, I, mean that, I mean that complimentary because Brady, <laughs> I mean, you, you, if you were a quarterback, you'd be Tom Brady for sure. You know, oh, yeah. Ro, Ro, you guys Ro, are way Ro, too nice to me. Ro, Ryan would be Brett Favre. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, well, okay, and who's going to win the Super Bowl? You got to throw it down right now. You're on a gauntlet. You got to gotta, gotta get an answer. What do you – you're right or wrong, doesn't matter. Tick, 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 tick. You know, I mean, Mahomes and KC last weekend really, really did some, did some, did some interesting things. So, you know, maybe KC. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm going to go, go on the limb there. I already bossed it. I picked the, uh, I picked the Baltimore Ravens. They let me down. I know. They look good. They look good, Ken. They look I, good, but they didn't. I had San Francisco and Baltimore in, in the Super Bowl, and, and Baltimore won it. And I'm, well, I'm Lauren, there. I want you to know that I went on record as picking the Montreal Al isn't that the And there we go. There we go. I think you're the first that was, person in a long time. <laughs> that was that was my team. Well, you pulled right that up, but that's pretty good. I have to get yeah. it. So <laughs> well listen, guys, uh distech.com, probably the best site. I encourage our audience, man, sign up for all their social media stuff. I mean, you know, a lot of people put social media stuff out there that doesn't have value. You guys create a ton of value with that. Uh the team will be at AHR. And Kenny, the question I thought you were gonna ask was what what sort of uh 
what, how, what are you guys going to show up in? What's Ryan got planned? Are you guys going to have the big limos again? But, but they'll be the ones hooping and hollering and having a good time. If you get a chance to go to the awards with them, because the only way to go is to either be a sponsor or go with a sponsor, they're definitely the fun bunch, man. You'll have a good time with them. But, uh, but then, then afterwards, you got AHR. You guys got a booth there. You'll be showing great products. And, and, I, and I understand you guys are throwing a party for me and Ken. Yeah, That's Tuesday night, just, just for Ken, I know he likes, uh, he likes some singing. So we've got a, that Howl at the Moon on Tuesday evening. Uh, so uh, you, can, you can register. Um, and I think that link, Lauren, is on LinkedIn, correct? Exactly. Yeah, if you go on our LinkedIn, we have it available, and you can sign right up there. Perfect. And, Lauren, if you, if you would, send the link to us, too, and we'll put it in the show notes for, control, uh, for the Control Talk show. We'll get that going as well. Sure thing. So. Sure thing. Man, thank you guys so much for taking time to be with thank us today. You. Let's do this more often. I mean, uh, every time we have a conversation with, with somebody from Distech, it's always fun. It's always enlightening. And uh, you guys keep on keeping on. You guys are doing great. Congratulations to both of you. Thanks. We're honored to be, uh, to be uh, part of the awards. Thank you. Awesome. Super. You're very, very welcome. All right, Kenny, I don't know about you, man. I was so impressed with Scott Hamilton and Lauren Scott. I mean, just super, super good people. And uh, it, it's amazing if, uh, if you, I think we've got a couple of spots left. If you're a finalist, want to come on the Control Talk Now show, reach out to me or Kenny. We'll try to get you on, endeavor to get you on. Kenny Smyers. It's kind of like old home week here, man. And the controls industry controls people don't go away. Software people in our industry don't go away. They just come back around with different companies. How about introducing an old friend with a new gig? Uh, it'd be a pleasure, Eric. This is one of the sharpest guys uh, I've ever met. Uh, he he started out uh, just with all these incredible ideas, and and he basically helped change our industry and, and brought graphics to the forefront and visualization. Uh, Eugene and his team were instrumental in, in bringing uh, our whole North America BAS market up to global standards with with, with visualization. So it's my pleasure to introduce Eugene Mazo, the Vice President of Software at Distech Controls at Acuity Brands. Welcome to the show, Eugene. Welcome, Thanks Eugene. Well, dude, okay. first thing we got to ask is, man, you the original man in black. Yep. Now, I know you've, you've had some children and, you know, gotten married since we, we dealt with you about 10, 10 years ago or so when you were just with DG, getting that off the ground. So we see in a softer, general, gentler side here with the white. What's going on, buddy? <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, it's a light blue. It's not, not white. I'll, I'll, I'll bring back the black. All right, good. We'll You're going to wear the black at the controls when there's awards, right? That's right. There you go. There you go. Well, Eugene, man, so uh, what's going on? I mean, last, last we heard of you, I mean, talked to you, I should say, you had just uh, uh, merged with uh, Acuity Brands. I know you've been over there working really, really hard with Arthur and the rest of the team and, and really helping those guys. But now you got a new role. You, I heard Kenny say Distech Acuity. Yeah, Distech, uh, Distech Control. So, you know, it's an interesting evolution of, of where, where I've been and where I've gotten to now. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty exciting story, I think. And, and from, like you mentioned, from the acquisition of Digilogic by Acuity Brands, Distech Controls was already owned by Acuity Brands. Uh, as you know, Acuity made a few more acquisitions uh, in their effort to transform more into a technology company from, uh, from a manufacturer. Uh, and it's, it's been a really interesting ride. You know, we've, we've learned a lot. We've made a significant impact on, on some of the portfolio products that go out to market from Acuity, um, as well as Distech. You know, and kind of all of us being under one umbrella, um, we've just been seeing trends develop and, and seeing what's going on in the IoT industry, what's going on in the building automation industry, and, and have been positioning our technology assets within Acuity uh, to best suit what we see uh, the market trends are. Uh, you know, so the, the most recent move uh, that we've decided to make was uh, DigiLogic is now going to be uh, led by Arthur. Arthur is going to become effectively sort of the, the general manager for DigiLogic products. Uh, those products are still going to be continued to be offered to our standard regular channel in the buildings and the IoT spaces. Uh, and with, with this deck, one of the things that, that became prevalent for us, especially for this, for this year, is to put a little bit more focus on software offerings and software products uh, and, and our overall software strategy. Uh, it's clear that the building automation industry, it's no longer just about providing great hardware, but it's about providing a great end-to-end -end solution, uh, a fully integrated solution that allows uh, you know, customers, whether they're systems integrators or end users, to... to to be efficient in how they're interacting with their systems. Uh, software is a very big piece of that. And uh, 
you know, within this deck, it's an exciting opportunity for me to be able to come in and kind of look at, okay, what are we doing? What are we doing from a software perspective? How do we go to market? What's our strategy? Uh, what are the possible products that we can offer to help improve some of these things? Um, and how, we do, how, how do we deliver once we've defined these products? Uh, so my role within this deck is, is, is very much on thinking through what that strategy is, working with the senior leadership team at this deck um, to figure out how we're actually going to make things happen uh, from a software perspective. You know, I'll be working very closely with the product management team led by Charles Pelletier, uh, very closely with Scott Hamilton and his sales organization, with Lauren and, and her marketing organization, with Steve Lucan and, and, uh, and his uh, engineering organization. So it's, it's really a cross-functional role where we'll be working with all of the, all of the teams and all of, all of the senior leadership to figure out how do we as a company, as a, as, as a disc tech, uh, put a little bit more focus on, on, our, on our software and provide better end-to-end -end solutions that include hardware and now great software. You know, I, uh, that is quite a mission statement. That's, that sounds like a lot of work. And, 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 uh, but, but my first question popped up was that, is, is there uh, ease of use uh, and increasing productivity for both the SI systems integrator and the user? Those are two separate pathways, unfortunately, huh? They're not, they're not traveling on the same roadmap. That's two different directions with two different uh, outcomes. They, they are, they are separate, separate pathways, but, uh, and, and this is one of the challenges. This, how, do, how do we figure out how to put out some products out there uh, that sort of are able to satisfy both? Right. If, if there's an overlap, take advantage of that overlap. Sure. Uh, if there's not, how do we put out two distinct products that play very well with each other? Uh, you know, that, that, that do actually ultimately end up satisfying both the systems integrator as well as the end user. Well, the, uh, the, we're finding out that uh, the end user kind of has, has taken uh, leadership and command of our train. They drive our train now. It used to be we used to have products that would say, this is what we got. You guys like it, right? You know, we're putting that square peg into that round circle and it's a good thing, right? Now we're seeing that the, the practicality of, of making a person's uh, relationship with their environment, spend 90% of their lives inside of buildings and it's finally really catching hold. And what are the, some of the most important user uh, demands and requests when, when, when you're designing this thing and you're sitting down, you're empathizing, you're thinking, I'm coming to work here. Uh, what, what are the, what's your list of uh, requisites that you have to deal with first? Well, you know, it, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that because when, when, you're, when you're saying end user in, in your context, you're talking about specifically the occupant, right? How do I make my space a lot more comfortable for me? Uh, we're looking at end users in, in, in really, you know, three three sort of buckets, if you think about it. Uh, the first end user is, is uh, the occupant. The second end user is the, the executive or the owner of the building. Uh, and the third end user is a facility manager. And each one of those personas have very different needs in terms of what they're, what they're looking for out of their BMS, BAS. Right. The occupant is much more concerned about their, their comfort. They want to be able to uh, easily uh, make their space, make their workspace comfortable. And quite frankly, they, they probably don't even want to think about uh, what, what controls are in their space, how, whether they're comfortable or not. They just expect it to be comfortable and for them to be able to be productive. I, I always say the best system uh, f from a occupant perspective, the best building automation system and the best building for them is one that they don't know is being controlled or being adjusted to their level. They just walk in and they're just comfortable. Um, and then from a facility manager's perspective, right, there's very different needs for them. For, from an owner and executive perspective, there's very different needs for them. So uh, one of the initiatives that we have is, of course, collecting a lot of voice of customer for, in terms of what are the, what are the solutions that, that we're building. Uh, and we're, like you said, it's, it's, it's interesting because in the software industry, this is very much the case all of the time. The end user is the one that tells you, or the customer is the one that tells the companies what it is that they need. And then the companies actually sort of follow suit. It's very rare that you'll have a company build a software and then say, okay, here you go, go, go buy it. Uh, there's a lot of voice of customer in software industry because it's, it's, uh, it's very important to build the right thing and get the, the users to, to, uh, to use it because software is very easy to switch. Uh, there's, it's, it's a very easy switching cost for the end customer. If they don't like a piece of software, they can switch to a different one with, with fairly less, uh, a small amount of hassle as opposed to hardware, 
you know, you've got something installed. It's a very, very big cost to actually switch over to something else. Well, I, so, I, I, I want to hop in real quick. Eugene, po apologize for interrupting, but, you know, it, it's sort of the chicken and the egg thing, right? You know, the hardware and the software. And my question for you is, our community will remember you came on and DG was preeminent visualization software and you would work with anybody's system, right? It was an overlay that you could put on. My question for you is how exciting is it for you now to be able to develop software with, for a specific control system, i.e. disk tech? And uh, what, is, what advantages is it to having, you know, an integrated software into a great, a great control system, hardware system like disk tech? Well, you know, it, so, the, the, so I, I want to separate out sort of the DG business and the DG software is still very much hardware agnostic. Uh, but the software that we are going to be building with Distech obviously is going to be working with the Distech uh, brand uh, uh, hardware. Although there will, I, I envision and I foresee some of the aspects and some of the products still continuing to be open uh, to where it can be used uh, on other platforms as well. But I think the biggest advantage of, of building software on our own hardware is there's a significant amount of influence that we from a software perspective can have on what the what the hardware looks like and the hardware capability and the needs there um, you know so so uh, being able to take full advantage of of the hardware capabilities that are provided uh, in building into our software not worrying about we need to support support you know five six other different hardware manufacturers uh, that's a very big plus. We can build in some really cool, uh, some really cool features within software, and the other way around, uh, sort of defining what and gathering the voice of customer, defining what our software product uh, needs to function like. We can have an impact on the roadmap of the hardware. You know, if it's something that a hardware uh, hardware product needs to implement to support the functionality within the software. We actually have the capability to influence that now, or we actually have the capability to come out with that now. Whereas if you're a standalone software company sort of sitting on third party hardware, it's, it's much more difficult to influence what that hardware is capable uh, of providing you from a feature side. Right. And what I'm hearing is an integrator, if I'm a disk tech uh, integrator, you know, installing disk tech products, I'm going, man, this is gonna probably gonna be a lot easier than it was before for the reasons you just mentioned. That's the idea. Yeah, that's the idea. The, the hardest thing with software, especially when you're, you're writing it and your team, I, I know that you guys, uh, you, you have quite a storied background. And, and we remember the days where you helped us with control trends. You actually helped us with that digital museum. And it was an extraordinary uh, adventure that I don't know how you do it. But when you're doing the software, and you're mapping out this, these uh, end, end solutions. I mean, uh, how many people are involved? What's, 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 what's the team? What, what's the daily routine look like? You guys, I mean, tell us a little bit about the the. How does software get written end to end? Yeah, of course there is. We we uh you know we're we're our team is in Oakland and, and our team is is more on ping pong, not not volleyball. Oh, or whatever. <laughs> yeah, okay. So we have we have ping pong champions. Uh, I'm I'm happy to say that I'm not one of them. Uh, nowhere near the top, so I'm okay. probably the guy that loses the most. But you know I'm trying. Uh, but yeah, of course, of course, there's a division of labor. You know, there's there's Charles Pelletier's product management team are the ones that are sort of leading the the product ownership. Uh, first, it all starts with sort of defining the strategy and what's our product base, uh, what our products going to be from a software perspective, what kind of solutions do we deliver to the market. That's one of the things where I'm uh, I'm sort of thinking through a lot of the a lot of what our roadmap and our future looks like right now uh, from a strategy perspective. Uh, then you know we get involved very very closely with Charles Pelletier's teams. Uh, the various product managers there, we define what is what does the product look like, what are the requirements, what do we think is necessary, what are the features, and we sort of work on 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 mapping out high level what we call epics. Uh, what what are the important things that need to be part of this particular product? Uh, then we get involved with with UI UX designers. That there's a whole team there that builds mockups, wireframes. We review those with a product management team. Then we we go to the engineering team engineering team estimates how long it's going to take, then they start working on that. There's changes, change requests, feature requests, things like that. So it's, it's a lot of people involved at various different aspects with product management sort of being uh, the driver for all of these things in terms of, you know, uh, defining the features, answering questions that may come up from designers or from engineers. Uh, and of course, once the product is ready, 
you know, marketing team gets involved because we've got to have a launch process. We've got to make sure that we're communicating the right message around the product and the right uh, launch process around it as well. And sales, of course, comes in afterwards. So it takes, you know, it, it, it takes a village to raise a software product. Nice, nice. <laughs> well, I knew it was complicated. I just wanted to hear it. You know, so I, I have oh, yeah. a rough idea. No, no I, but uh, the, the um, software is the future. Data is the future. Right. Well, and, sp and speaking of that, Eugene, again, you know, you've been, you've been directly involved with software, with the, you know, the building automation controls industry now for, since we've known you, so at least 10 years. What changes have you seen in terms of, uh, you know, software requirements, what people are asking for with software and, and the role that software is playing versus when you first got started? You know, it, it, and that's a great question. One of the things that, that I think, the biggest thing that I think I've seen was uh, when we just started and, and we started Digilogic in the building automation industry, we started in 2007. Um, and back then it was, you know, it, it was all about, it was all about hardware and it was all about building automation systems uh, from a from a hardware and middleware perspective. Nobody really focused on on software. Uh, software was sort of a necessary evil, you know, the, the a necessary piece of the puzzle to help sell more of the hardware and firmware. Um, and, and there was as long there was very little focus on what is the user experience, the end user experience going to be like uh, using these systems. It was much more look, it works. We can actually automatically con control these things and then we, we, we can do it. We can actually do it um, rather than, look, we can do it efficiently and we can provide a great user experience to the end user. And this is, I think, where we saw an opportunity as DigiLogic to step in and improve that user experience. Um, so it was a little bit of an uphill battle at first. So we, we, saw, we saw sort of this, this shift of, of a mindset from 2007 to where we are now, where Software is now no longer sort of, you're doing what? You're doing software? You're doing user experience? Who cares about that? It, it's got to work. The system's got to work, right? Where the system working is now a given. Yeah, you expect these things. It's no longer a shocker that you can remotely control or, 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 or set, you know, temperature set points. Uh, you, you're no longer in shock that you can see the operation of all of your, of all of your HVAC equipment remotely. Uh, that's no longer a, a, something that impresses. Now, now it's, You've got software, of course you've got software. You have to have really good software. In fact, if you don't have a great user experience, you're not even gonna be part of this bid, right? So I think the industry mindset has shifted from, wow, that's really cool to, yeah, of course you have to have this. Now show me how you're actually gonna save me money by improving my user experience or show me how you're gonna, why you're the best in the user experience. What sort of features and, 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 uh, and opportunities can you provide to me that'll make my life even easier? based on the software. So I think that this whole acceptance of software in the industry and expectation of it being really good, uh, right. I think that's evolved quite significantly. Well, Eugene, I've been accused of being a very, very superficial guy many, many times in my life. Uh, and because I think looks matter. And one of the things that has really impressed me about your software from the very first time I saw it was the aesthetics of it, the way you laid things out, the color combinations, the, just the aesthetic. It was the most beautiful uh, visualization platform, you know, I, I'd seen, and I guess it's been a while since I've seen it. Are, are you still, uh, you still got the eye candy for everybody? Of course, there's always eye candy for everybody. <laughs> I mean, if you look at, you know, if you look at products that are coming out of Google or Apple or, or Uber or Twitter or any of these modern software applications, they very much focus on the simplicity of use and, and the aesthetics. Uh, you know, that's the first thing a customer sees. They see the aesthetic. They need to be bought in. They need to be impressed and they need to want to want to continue to use the software. Uh, if you don't have that, you know, you, you're, it doesn't matter what kind of functionality you have. If your software doesn't look good and is not easy to use, it, it'll never fly. You know what, I'd, um, I, I'd certainly agree. And, and you know, the going back to what you were saying about the, uh, nest, the software was once upon a time necessary evil and, and how it's evolved. I mean, you really took us through the 2007 up forward and, and we're seeing some really, uh, you know, wild things that the software one day with, when it's starting to merge with this artificial intelligence and, and this machine to machine and is part of your, uh, is, is that the future? Are you guys working? In other words, are you incorporating artificial intelligence now into your, into your software? I'm sure you are, but I'm just saying, we don't know much about it, so we're we're anxious to hear it and get the lead lead foot in there because uh, 
artificial intelligence has just become the buzzword again. Now. I mean, we went, went through data, we went through uh, you know all the different buzzwords, we went through cybersecurity buzzwords. You know, now it's artificial intelligence, and we're camped out there. Nobody really knows anything about it. I mean, they do. No, I mean, we, we can't even get a definition of artificial intelligence. No, no comment, but but uh, there's going to be some very exciting things that I can tell you that are going to be coming out of. <laughs> well, I feel like I hit the sweet spot again. I, I got that no comment before from one of your colleagues, you know. No, you, you're absolutely right. There's, you know, artificial intelligence is huge, huge right now in every industry, and there's no reason why it can't be a huge, uh, huge benefit for us and a huge impact on, on the building automation industry. So uh, look, some ver look for some very, very... Um, exciting products and things that are coming out of uh, out of this type of controls bravo very very exciting well eugene are you going to be at the control trends awards by any chance absolutely of course all right now you know it's it's sort of a casual affair because it's football so i guess you got to wear your raiders black if you're going to stay in with the the um the theme of the or who's your who's your pro Steelers. Team? you can wear with Steelers black if you want I, I, it's it's the Niners. I'm hoping the Niners are there, and we'll mm -hmm. we'll uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll wear the Niners red underneath, and then the there black the black well, jacket over the top. Well, I tell you, we'll, we'll we'll give you a break. You can wear Niners red for the Control Trends Awards event, but people might not recognize you with that. You're distinctive. Hey, I picked those hat. guys to win. I uh, go to the Super Bowl in Baltimore, to win. So I still got half a prayer left. I'm rooting for San Francisco too. They get they get a hell of a team. Good good. Yeah, so good, Eugene, good quarterback. Sort, sort of getting back uh, as we sort of wrap up here, um, it sounds like you're getting a lot of voice of customer, a lot of input. Um, is there a channel to you for our community of, you know, they have some wants or desires regarding the software, or does that just come through their typical disk tech rep and never get back to you that way? Yeah, the, the, the typical disk tech channel, I'm very much ingrained, like I mentioned earlier, I'm very much ingrained into sort of the disk tech leadership team and all of the various teams within disk tech. Uh, so, any feedback that makes it back to the disk tech, whether it's forum or or whatever, or, or the RSMs, you know, the sort of the standard disk tech channels, uh, all of that feedback as it relates to software will definitely make it back to me. So feel free to awesome. work. Awesome, awesome. All right. Well, Eugene, man, thank you so much for taking some time to be with us. Uh, dude, we're going to really enjoy seeing what you're, what you're going to do with in this next role and how it's going to evolve the disk tech and the QID offerings. So, uh, Hopefully we'll get you come back on the show sometime and keep us updated as things progress. Yeah, it's exciting stuff. We'll do. All right. All right we'll see you at the control trends. There you got cool. Eugene Mazzo, AKA the Joe Montana of the software industry or <laughs> who's our, Oh, or Jimmy Garofalo. <laughs> Jimmy Garofalo, right? Yeah. The Jimmy G. All right. There you go. Cool. Dude, I've never seen Eugene Mazzo without black before, man. The men in black. What's up with that? I'll tell you what, uh, he's always fun. Uh, what a remarkable guy. Uh, you know, he just loves his job. has a lot of passion, and uh, he's really good at what he does. But uh, when he dresses up, you'll know. Uh, I, I always go back to B.B. Uh, King in New York when he came up, and he, he helped us out with the uh, Control Trans Awards. And, uh, yeah, Dancing with the Stars, remarkable guy. He's uh, a lot of good things. A lot of good things. Well, Kenny, it's pretty exciting. We've uh, we've gotten Control Trends has gotten approved to actually live stream on links uh, on uh, LinkedIn, which are not that many people that are allowed to do that now. So we're going to hopefully at one day live stream this show onto LinkedIn. But uh, as of now, we're doing some what we call rebroadcast, where we're live streaming rebroadcast of previous shows. And part of what we're really trying to do to get people in the spirit is we're sort of rebroadcasting uh, people getting awards from shows of the past so uh, you'll see more of that the next week or so and then next week our guest include kelly's richard campbell so you'll want to make sure you tune in next week for that show as well anything else you got before we hop off no i, I again like you say the um all the finalists are, are remarkable people remarkable solutions and products uh just congratulations to everyone uh, i think josh felpern will be joining us too as well and uh it just Great well, that's leadership. right. Yeah. Great executives, great leadership. Yeah. But it's just, uh, I, I'm, I'm really proud of our industry. I, and the more uh, in-depth work we do, the more interviews we do, the more I realize that we've got a heck of a structure here. And uh, our industry looks great. We need to get more people in here so that we can you know, keep this thing going and, and really take advantage. The, the technology is here. Our world needs it. Our, our planet needs it. Our buildings need it. So we just got to keep on pushing on and making sure that we are a, 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 you know, a star in the sky that attracts the right kind of attention because we sure got a future for uh, Yeah, kind of like the, the star behind your shoulder there, like the control trend star. Control trends one. Oh, that, I yeah. like that symbol. Every time I look at that, I think, uh, you know, I think we should, you know, like put that on a jacket and then do interviews with it while we're wearing it. 
Yeah, maybe maybe we will. Maybe we will. Well, listen, um, the show's coming up coming up very quickly. Uh, people keep asking, how do I get to this show? You reach out to the sponsors. The sponsors have the tickets. I'm sure they'd love to host you. So we've got that. The voting ends January 27th. You still have time to vote. That's another week on Control Talk Now, the Smart Buildings video cast and podcast. We appreciate you guys tuning in. Next week, we've got a big show. Guests will include Richard Campbell from Kelly. Josh Felper from Siemens, so you're going to want to, going to, going to be so you're going to want to definitely check that out. So remember, be bold, stay in control. And as Lauren Scott from Distech said, show up, mean it, make it better. Indeed, indeed. indeed.